Test one, two. Testing one, two. I'm at a representative's mic. This is one, a test for the mic. Okay, I'm not going to be shy. I'm talking on the mic. One, two, three, four, five. This is a test to the mic, down to the core, down to the media center. I want to make sure it works. Is that better? Yeah. Check, check, one, two.
Uh, the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will now come to order. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Today's hearing is another benchmark in our series examining decarbonization of our economy by mid-century. Transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in America. While debate is often focused on light-duty automobiles, more than 40 percent of the uh, sector's emissions come from other sources, uh, including buses, trucks, ships, trains, and planes. Much like at our September hearing on the industrial sector, it will quickly become apparent that non-light-duty segments of transportation have numerous challenges to overcome in order to achieve necessary, ambitious decarbonization targets. For one, in recent decades, there has been, has been growth in vehicles miles traveled, and in many cases, this growth is expected to continue. Second, these vehicles are capital-intensive investments with slow turnover. Investment decisions being made today will impact the emissions profile of the sector and, in turn, our ability to decarbonize it for decades to come. Other significant barriers, costs, technology development, and infrastructure needs will not be news to anyone. We know that we need investments uh, to in research, especially in advanced batteries and fuel cells. We need new infrastructure to enable the transition, including a national network of alternative fueling and charging stations. <coughs> Excuse me. And we need greater market demand for cleaner fuels. <coughs> Transportation emissions are a diverse set of challenges. Transforming the sector will be no easy task. But many of the principles that we have been discussing as part of our broader economy-wide approach apply here. We need to ensure that pollution reduction, both climate and traditional air pollutants, occurs in frontline communities, near ports, near airports, near highways. We must be open to many different technologies and pathways to decarbonization, and we need a comprehensive portfolio approach. Establishing a price signal can be a critical component of our response and can speed up adoption and innovation in low emissions alternatives, but carbon pricing is not a silver bullet, and that is especially true for transportation's sake. We must look to performance standards and other complementary investments, such as in research and infrastructure. Today, we will hear recommendations from across that sector that should push us towards this portfolio approach. And while the challenges seem daunting, there are great solutions already being developed and deployed as we speak. Some are commercially available right now. More are expected to become viable in the near future. Efficiency remains a top solution across all modes. For medium and heavy-duty vehicles, the National Academies recently found strengthening fuel economy standards can reduce fuel consumption by as much as 30 percent by 2030. Electrification is also a powerful solution for certain parts of the uh, sector. We have seen the potential of EVs with light-duty vehicles, and today adoption of electric buses is occurring at an even faster rate than passenger vehicles. Public and private sector leaders have quickly come to realize that the, uh, there are opportunities from electrifying transit and school buses and delivery trucks, vehicles that take shorter, often predetermined routes and can take advantage of predictable periods of non-use for charging. But electrification is not the only option. In applications facing weight or distance concerns, hydrogen energy is a very promising solution, especially given the speed of refueling. This has enabled fuel cells to find a role in warehouses. They are beginning to be deployed in ports and on tarmacs, and there are great opportunities for long-haul freight trucking powered by hydrogen. Despite these exciting options, which are rapidly becoming more affordable, there will be li likely still be a need for lower emissions liquid fuels for years to come. This is especially true for marita mari maritime and aviation, where sustainable fuels are just beginning to be commercialized. Development of cost-competitive drop-in fuels largely compatible with existing systems is critical for these very difficult to decarbonize applications. <clears throat> I hope today's hearing will help us better understand what we will need to do to help develop demand for new and cleaner fuels. But in all these cases, major innovation in transportation will not happen without our leadership, without our partnership, and without our vision for building the enabling infrastructure. I thank each and every witness here today for 
attending this hearing and look forward to the words of advice that you will share. Your testimony is especially meaningful to our efforts for decarbonization. Thank you all for attending. With that, I'll now recognize the uh, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change, Representative Shimkus, for five minutes for his opening statement. Welcome, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today the subcommittee turns to what is poss possible for decarbonizing transportation beyond automobiles and light trucks. Uh, this means aviation, shipping, and forest rail, et cetera. Uh, it means the medium and heavy vehicles used in agriculture, industry, transit to move loads of all types on the highways and throughout every size community across the United States. The transportation sector produces 29 percent of the nation's carbon dioxide emissions, according to the EPA. Medium and heavy vehicles account for just under a quarter of these emissions, which provides a large target for further emission reductions. These vehicles, which are powered mostly by diesel engines, also provide a large role in the economy of the United States. According to the Diesel Technology Forum, heavy duty diesel engines were responsible for delivering $4 trillion in economic activity in the first quarter of 2019. This includes agriculture, mining, construction, and transportation, and represents 12 percent of all private sector industry activity. Last year, more than one million new heavy diesel engines were produced on American assembly lines and provide new, more efficient products for use in future economic activity. In the transportation sector alone, diesel is the most visible in medium and heavy trucking. Of the 14 million commercial trucks on the road, 75 percent are powered by diesel engines. 97 percent of the Class 8 tractor-trailer fleets runs on diesel. And the forum and some of our witnesses this morning will testify the quality of the new engines is providing large environmental benefit. Between 2010 and 2030, more efficient diesel trucks are expected to save some 130 billion gallons of fuel and 1.3 billion tons of CO2 more than the emissions from all light-duty vehicles in a given year. This is particularly impressive when you consider that vehicle miles traveled in medium and heavy truck trucking is projected to increase. The Energy Information Administration projects that vehicle miles traveled just for medium and heavy commercial and freight trucking to increase nearly 60 percent by 2050. I raise these facts to underscore the point that getting to zero emissions in transportation will not be pass possible anytime soon, and it will not mean the, the elimination of the diesel engine anytime soon. There are a host of reasons for this. The availability and performance of fuels and engines, the technological limits of efficiency improvements, the complex infrastructure for transportation goods, the affordability of new technology, capital cost and fleet turnover, the performance of logistical realities of each subsector and the fundamental need for affordable, reliable engine power in every aspect of our economy and our daily lives. Congress has to be practical and realistic when it confronts environmental policies concerning the transportation sector. Setting unrealistic goals because it checks political boxes is not how you develop and ultimately enact successful bipartisan policies. 100 by 50, net zero emissions, clean energy economy, deep, deep carbonization, these are taglines, descriptions. Some may be workable, some may not be workable, but what's not workable or productive is legislation by a tagline. Instead of taglines, let's legislate by looking at whether policies will raise costs, lock in policies that constrict innovation op opportunities, inhibit transportation, and negatively impact not only commerce, but what people rely upon every day. The good news is trends for improving transportation emissions are positive, as we will hear from industry witnesses this morning. We will also hear several witnesses talk ab about the ongoing innovation and prospects for cleaner fuels and engines in transportation. I would like to welcome, in particular, our witnesses from the National Association of Truck Stop Operators, J.P. Feldhansen. He can speak about benefits of policies that focus on our existing energy infrastructure, on our renewable fuels policy, and on the innovation that is driven by focusing on needs of consumers, in this case the trucking industry and the driving public. Tim Bluebaugh from the Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association will provide an overview about the success in reducing criteria pollutants and carbon dioxide emissions and the investments and challenges to developing zero emission truck technologies. The testimony from Mr. Eckerly at Cummins, Mr. Baines from Nesty also highlight what is possible in other transportation models. This, this promises to be an informative hearing, and I look forward to the testimony and to identifying what may be possible to do while preserving the essential roles of heavy-duty engines in our economy and our way of life. And at, at the conclusion of this, Mr. Chairman, I, I want my colleagues to make sure they take a look at this chart we placed at their desk from uh, Loves. It's in response to questions I had to them yesterday 
yesterday, it, I think it's highly instructive about the challenges that we have on cost, fuel capacity range, and, and there also is an, a line for carbon intensity scores that I think is just highly educational. And I know we've noticed a hearing for next week on the renewable fuel standard. That does play a big role into this debate that we're having today. I'm glad you called it. And we can use current public policy and reform some issues around the RFS that could be very helpful, especially in the debate we're having today. So I'm thank you for noticing that hearing, and I look forward to working with you on both of them. And I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back, and we thank you. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Representative Pallone, chair of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Uh, Thank you, Hello. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. This morning, we're holding the fourth hearing in our series on building a 100 percent clean economy. And each of these hearings has focused on a separate sector of our economy. And today, we'll be discussing key elements of the transportation sector, which is the largest source of climate pollution in our economy. Specifically, we'll hear from our witnesses about the challenges and opportunities of decarbonizing medium and heavy duty vehicles, aviation, rail, and maritime shipping. And this hearing and the overall series of hearings are critical as we work to develop legislation to decarbonize the American economy and build a cleaner, more prosperous future for all Americans. It will be one of the most ambitious, challenging, and necessary transformations our country has ever attempted. And our target of net zero climate pollution by 2050 is founded on science, which tells us we must act with urgency if we're to avoid the worst effects of the climate crisis. To conquer this challenge, we need the best ideas from all stakeholders and sectors. And last month, this subcommittee held a hearing focused on decarbonizing the industrial sector. We heard from experts about the challenges to reducing emissions from some of the most difficult to decarbonize industrial processes. But more importantly, we learned about the opportunities to overcome those challenges. Today's hearing will shift gears and focus on how we transport the industrial products covered in last month's hearing as well as people, cargo, and the products we use in our everyday lives. Transportation is obviously vital to our economy. The fast, efficient movement of people and goods helps businesses grow and communities thrive. Yet given the size and complexity of this sector, decarbonization presents significant challenges, especially for non-light duty vehicles like planes, trains, trucks, buses, and ships. And I look forward to hearing about the different policy solutions for this sector from our witnesses today. We often hear about the role innovation will play in addressing climate change and transitioning to a 100 percent clean economy. In fact, we can already see how innovation is changing the transportation sector. Manufacturers like today's witness Cummins are developing new products and systems for low or zero carbon transportation. And this innovation is critical. But as we've heard at every hearing in our climate series, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's driven by policy. And I would imagine we're going to hear that same message today. Any suggestion that policy plays no role in spurring American industry to innovate new technologies willfully ignores the last half century of American progress. For decades under laws such as the Clean Air Act, the federal government and state leaders have set ambitious standards that spur industry to develop solutions that protect public health and the environment while growing our economy. And that same formula will work for many aspects of addressing the climate crisis, including in the transportation sector. In fact, it's already working. For example, today's efficiency standards for medium and heavy-duty trucks are reducing emissions from those vehicles. According to the National Academy of Sciences, even greater efficiency gains are well within our reach, but they do require policy support. Efficiency standards will similarly play an important role in subsectors that cannot be readily electrified, such as aviation, maritime shipping, and rail. Cutting pollution will also require a continued shift to cleaner fuels, including low and zero carbon electricity and liquid fuels. And this transition towards climate safe fuels is key to decarbonizing the transportation sector, but it comes with its uh, challenges, particularly the need to develop recharging and refueling infrastructure across the country. Cities and companies are helping to lead the way, deploying electric buses and delivery vehicles throughout their fleets. These vehicles have the dual benefits of improving local air quality while reducing carbon pollution, but the rate at which these clean vehicles are being deployed is woefully insufficient, and we have to act to accelerate that transition. So I just look forward to hearing from our witnesses as we continue our work to determine the best ways to reach our climate goals and develop a 100 percent clean economy of the future. I don't know if anybody wants my time, but if not, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
Uh, the uh, chairman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Representative Walden, ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome all of our panelists uh, and in advance. A couple of us are on a couple of subcommittees. Well, I'm actually on all of them, like Chairman Pallone is. So uh, we've got another hearing going on downstairs, so we'll be bouncing back and forth. But thank you for being here. Thanks for your testimony. Um, I want to thank Chairman for holding this hearing as well as we review the challenges and opportunities associated with decarbonizing the U.S. transportation sector and focus on the light duty portions of that sector today. I very much look forward to the witness testimony, particularly from several panelists who can speak to innovation in engines, in fuel, and energy infrastructure this morning. I'll have a question for you about some of that. Uh, we've got Red Rocks Biofuels in my district, and so we'll have some discussion about that when I get back. There's a lot of underappreciated work toward uh, cleaner engines, and today provides us uh, with an opportunity to take a look at some of those innovation initiatives. A couple of years ago, Daimler uh, Trucks North America opened its high desert research facility and proving grounds in my district, Madras, Oregon, which I visited during construction. And that track provides durability and performance testing. It will be critical for proving new, innovative, and more efficient technologies and represents the constant effort by the industry to innovate, to make cleaner, more efficient engines, as well as to make design changes in the vehicle bodies to improve energy conservation. Reducing transportation emissions is a large, difficult, and complex topic, one that impacts all Americans, especially those whose livelihoods depend upon the affordable and reliable delivery of products across the nation's transportation systems, which probably just about all of us. Last Congress, Republicans worked closely with Democrats on this committee to pass bipartisan legislation setting national standards for the development of autonomous vehicles. We agreed then that national standards would encourage investment in innovation in the United States in this important sector of the economy. As important, I think we all acknowledge that this innovation would reduce highway accidents, save lives, and increase fuel economy while reducing emissions. In fact, according to the Energy Information Administration, by 2050, you could see as much as a 44 percent reduction in fuel consumption among connected autonomous vehicles and up to 18 percent reduction among trucks. The report says, and I quote, in one representative platooning test, two semi-trucks were pl platooned at a constant speed of 64 miles an hour at a 36-foot distance. The configuration resulted in an average fuel consumption savings of 4.5 percent for the lead truck and 10 percent for the following truck. That was uh, their report. Unfortunately, that bipartisan work went up on the rocks in the Senate. Um, although it's taken a little longer than we'd like, I remain uh, confident that the bicameral bipartisan staff discussions that have been ongoing for months this Congress will shortly produce substantial results. So we can't miss the opportunity for the United States to lead on developing this technology and delivering safety and mobility benefits for Americans, particularly our senior citizens and people with disabilities. Meanwhile, the administration has outlined a national policy that seeks to ensure people have the cars they want at prices they can afford. That will actually enable a more rapid turnover, I believe, to a cleaner, more efficient fleet. And at the same time, uh, we've seen California uh, seeking an aggressive and expensive standard setting scheme that would drive up the price of cars and trucks nationwide, which I think would slow the uh, cleaner emitting vehicles coming to market and being uh, with the uptake. Republicans believe in putting the consumer first and encouraging American innovators to do what they do best, which is innovate. In the run-up to these series of hearings, we've urged our majority colleagues to avoid resurrecting uh, economically harmful top-down regulatory policies that punish consumers at higher prices and fewer choices. You know, California frequently chooses this path as a result of their cap-and-trade scheme, un unique refining requirements, and gas taxes. California consumers pay about 77 cents a gallon more than the national average, 77 cents a gallon. They're, they're not really happy about paying 413 per gallon to get to work and take the kids to soccer practice. Republicans support innovation, conservation, adaptation, and preparation. We believe these policies have caused America to lead the world in carbon emissions reductions. We believe overregulation and high taxation hurts consumers, especially low-income consumers, and that can lead to economic stagnation. So in line with this principle, there are bipartisan bills Congress could pass today that would ensure the United States remains the global leader in emissions reduction, in economic productivity and clean energy uh, production, bills that focus on what works for Americans and their economic interests and well-being. Earlier this month, I expressed in a letter to uh, Chairman Pallone that we're encouraged by his expressed willingness to develop climate policies through a collaborative approach that would ensure every affected community, industry, and stakeholder has a seat at the table. 
Again, we are eagerly awaiting the opportunity to work together on these important policies to encourage innovation, conservation, and adaptation. There's a lot we can do together in this space to help consumers and reduce emissions. Today's hearing gives us an overview on the transportation system, some of the initiatives there that would be good for consumers, the economy, and the environment. Mr. Chairman, thanks again for the hearing. We look forward to the testimony. The gentleman yields back, and now I, as chair, would like to uh, remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Uh, now we introduce our witnesses, and uh, you look like you're uh, quite the team there, uh, shoulder to shoulder. Um, we'll begin with Dr. Emily Weinberger, climate economist of the Rhodium Group. Um, is that Weinberger or Wimberger? Wimberger, I apologize. Wimberger, Mr. Jeremy Baines, President of Nesty U.S., uh, Mr. J.P. Field Hansen, Managing Director and Vice President, Musket Corporation on behalf of the National Association of Truck Stop Operators, the Honorable Fred Fellman, Commissioner, Port of Seattle, and the uh, Northwest Seaport Alliance, Mr. Timothy Blubau, Executive Vice President uh, of Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association, Dr. Wayne Eckerley, Vice President for Research and Technology at Cummins, and finally, Mr. Adrian Martinez, Sto Staff Attorney uh, for Earth Justice. Uh, before we begin, I would like to explain the lighting system. In front of you are a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute left. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. Uh, at this time, the chair will now recognize Ms. Wimberger for five minutes, please, to provide um, your opening statement. Thank you, Chair, Ranking Member, and Distinguished Members of the Subcommittee. My name is Emily Wimberger, and I'm an economist at Rhodium Group, which is an independent firm whose research supports decision makers in the public, financial services, corporate, and nonprofit sectors. Prior to joining Rhodium, I was the Chief Economist at the California Air Resources Board. Thank you for convening this hearing today and inviting me to speak. First, I'll start. I'll reiterate some alarming emission trends that were mentioned by the chair. Each year, Rhodium provides an independent assessment of U.S. <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions and progress made towards long-term climate goals. In July of this year, Rhodium released Taking Stock 2019, which found that by 2025, the U.S. is on track to reduce emissions anywhere from 12 to 19 percent below 2005 levels. This is a far cry to commitments that were made under the Paris Agreement pledge to reduce emissions 26 to 28 percent. Even more alarming, rhodium's emissions estimates for 2018 show that greenhouse gas emissions rose last year after three years of decline. Rhodium estimates that carbon emissions from f fossil fuel combustion increased 2.7 percent in 2018, the second largest annual increase since the year 2000. The transportation sector remained the largest source of emissions on the back of strong economic growth and demand for diesel and jet fuel. While these trends put the U.S. farther from achieving long-term climate goals, decarbonizing non-light-duty transportation presents tremendous opportunities for American innovation and global economic leadership. To, meaningful redu to meaningfully reduce emissions in the sector, we must reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Federal policies that focus on electrification, low carbon fuels, and efficiency can create markets for advanced technologies that will reduce emissions and create opportunities for growth across the U.S. economy. Since 2010, sales of electric passenger vehicles in the U.S. have grown from under 10,000 a year to over 360,000. However, we've not seen that uptake in the non-light duty sectors. In the U.S., electric buses have only recently been introduced in very low volumes and electric trucks have yet to meaningfully reach the market. There are, however, examples of policies that drive electrification in non-light duty applications. Globally, 99% of the electric bus fleet is in China, where national mandates have led to widespread electrification. In California, regulations are driving electrification of buses, marine vessels, off-road equipment, and trucks, as the state works to achieve legislatively mandated climate targets and air quality standards. California's policies have created markets for energy efficient products, low carbon fuels, and zero emission vehicles and equipment. The state is home to nearly half of the zero emission vehicles in the United States, over 40% of North American clean fuel investment, and the world's best electric car manufacturer. 
There are also important opportunities for low carbon fuels to complement electrification and non-light duty transportation. There are high barriers to electrification in some applications where deployment of advanced biofuels and electrofuels created with clean power will be critical for decarbonization. Effective policy design can drive long-term deployment of the lowest carbon fuels by providing clear market signals and certainty to businesses, making investments in fuel development and deployment. The Federal Renewable Fuel Standard and California's Low Carbon Fuel Standard have been critical in driving innovation in low carbon fuels. However, biofuels derived from plants and waste make up just 5% of current U.S. liquid fuel demand, and advanced biofuels have struggled to reach market. Efficiency is the third tenet of decarbonizing non-light duty transportation, moving more people and goods with fewer emissions. While tremendous efficiency gains have been made in light duty vehicles, similar gains have yet to be realized in other applications. Federal policies that target engine standards, more stringent locomotive and ocean-going vessel standards, and deployment of cleaner technologies for aircraft will result in cost savings to consumers and American businesses. In addition, policies that increase efficient mobility and transit options can provide health and community benefits. Technologies that increase fuel economy can also amplify carbon reductions achieved through electrification and the use of low carbon fuels. Reducing emissions in non-light duty transportation applications presents a tremendous opportunity to drive American innovation and create markets for new technologies that can be exported around the world. It is time for strong federal leadership through comprehensive policies that promote electrification, low carbon fuels, and efficiency. There are examples of cost-effective comprehensive policies in states, cities, and regions around the globe that reduce emissions and promote economic growth. It is time for the U.S. to lead in this challenge. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on such a very critically important topic. Thank you, Dr. Wimberger. And now, Mr. Baines, you are recognized for five minutes, please. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shinkas, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jeremy Baines, and I'm the president of Nesta US. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Nesta is a publicly traded company headquartered in Finland and with a rapidly growing presence in the United States. We are the world's largest producer of renewable diesel, and we'll be the number one producer of sustainable aviation fuel by the end of the year. We are also in the business of fighting climate change, and our purpose is to create a healthier planet for our children and for the next generations. We are all wondering how to provide solutions for these hard to decarbonize transportation sectors. We can't, after all, just hook an extension cord to an airplane or a ship, but there are viable, scalable, and sustainable solutions. Low carbon liquid transportation fuels must do the heavy lifting to decarbonize these sectors. That's why Neste shifted its business model to focus on making and selling renewable products that can help decarbonize hard to abate industries like heavy commercial trucking, marine transport, and aviation. I will spend my time today talking about the aviation industry, specifically how sustainable aviation fuel, also known as SAF, can help reduce carbon emissions from air travel. Today, aviation is responsible for around 2.7% of US greenhouse gas emissions. By 2050, the United Nations project that the global emissions could triple. The airline industry recognizes this challenge. They have voluntarily committed to halve carbon emissions from 2005 levels over the next 30 years. I am inspired by this ambition and how they are tackling this challenge by improving efficiency and taking other steps to reduce the industry's climate impact. These are steps in the right direction, but as the industry acknowledges, even all these steps are not enough to hit the industry goal. SAF must be part of the solution if we want our children to live in a world where air travel is not limited. SAF is a drop-in fuel and works with today's aircraft engines as well as existing storage, logistics, and airport infrastructure. SAF can reduce life cycle greenhouse gas emissions by 80% or more and emits significantly less pollutants like particulate matter. This is particularly meaningful to communities that are disproportionately impacted by pollution. SAF can be made from a wide variety of sustainable, scalable, and renewable low carbon feedstocks, such as used cooking oils, MSW, forestry residue, or even captured carbon dioxide. Most importantly, SAF is available today. It's not a someday solution that has yet to be proven at scale. 
Unfortunately, there are structural and policy challenges that are preventing SAF from taking off. For example, SAF receives less credits under the renewable fuel standard compared to renewable ground transportation fuels. This means that it's more profitable for a company like Neste to produce renewable fuels for road transportation compared to SAF. Congress can help change this dynamic by ensuring there's a level playing field for all renewable fuels. Neste sees immense opportunity in SAF. It is the only product available today that can keep planes flying and reduce emissions. To help the aviation industry grow, SAF production needs to start rapidly increasing now. The head of the International Civil Aviation Organization put it like this, SAF production capacity needs to double and then double again. We think there needs to be several more agains in this math. I believe this is a compelling reason for Congress to consider SAF specific policies. Some promising options include a permanent blenders or investment tax credit, exemptions to jet fuel excise taxes, or a wind multiplier. When I joined Neste, I was skeptical of renewable fuels. I felt at the time they were too complicated, costly, and unrealistic. Today, I am in a very different place. I see renewable fuels, and especially SAF, as smart business, and a way to create a better world for our children. With policy support to scale the industry, SAF can provide a large contribution to the big emission reduction challenges we face. Now is the time to start a robust policy discussion to meet these goals. Neste looks forward to working with Congress and the aviation industry to identify win-win opportunities that can incentivize SAF and decarbonize air travel. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baines. We'll talk about that extension cord later. Um, and Mr. Um, Field Hansen, you are now recognized for five minutes, please. Welcome. Thank you very much, and I'll keep the excellence going here. Uh, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member uh, Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. My name is J.P. Field Hansen, and I'm the Vice President of Muscat and Trillium, which are the supply and alternative fuel arms of Love's Travel Stops. Love's is a family-owned business that has grown from a single convenience store to the second largest travel, travel center chain in the United States, with more than 500 retail fueling stations in 41 states. Today I'm testifying on behalf of the National Association of Truck Stop Operators. NATSO is the premier national trade association representing Love's and other off-highway fuel retailers. In my testimony today, I hope to demonstrate to you that travel center companies such as Love's are invaluable partners to policymakers as you seek to minimize the carbon footprint of the transportation sector. Motor fuel retailers are agnostic to the type of fuel we sell. However, our customers' decisions are largely driven by price. The industry is very capable of efficiently bringing the lowest cost fuel to market. At the same time, customers are reluctant to transition to more expensive alternatives. This should be viewed as an opportunity, not as an obstacle. Motor fuel retailers are effectively surrogates for the customer. If you want to encourage consumers to transition toward an alternative fuel, we know based on our experience what types of incentive programs work and what types of policies do not work. We could compete to sell low-cost fuel. If the government can provide the re uh, requisite signals and policy certainty, we can bring actual affordable alternative fuel solutions to market. We are already doing that today. It is tempting to focus solely on how we want the world to look in 10, 20, or 30 years. I'm here today to offer our assistance in this endeavor, and also to urge you not to allow these larger aspirations to distract you from making near-term progress. By building on existing policies and infrastructure, we can improve the transportation sector emissions footprint in the short term while also considering more long-term solutions. We should be able to do both. As detailed further in my written testimony, Loves has invested significant capital to bring alternative fuels to market. Some examples would be uh, our company Trillium uh, agreed to set up a public-private partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation where we constructed 29 CNG stations serving more than 1,600 transit buses throughout the state. In Mi Miami-Dade County, we have built two CNG stations that are capable of refueling 600 CNG buses for the Mi Miami-Dade County transit system. We also provide full-service design, installation, and maintenance for on-site solar and power generation projects, enabling customers to reduce their energy bills and improve resiliency. 
Trillium designed, built, and operate the nation's largest heavy-duty hydrogen refueling station to support the Orange County Transportation Authority's fleet of hydrogen vessels. And Trillium earlier this year completed the successful acquisition of the renewable natural gas production facility at the Point Loma wastewater treatment uh, facility in San Diego. And we also operate all four of the San Diego Metropolitan Transit System CNG stations. This is just a small example. In undertaking this project, we responded to public policy and the need of our customers, and we are eager to continue playing this role. That is precisely how it's supposed to work. I encourage the subcommittee to learn from these successes and apply those lessons to any incentive programs you create going forward. Once the regulatory incentive uh, regime is in place that makes alternative fuel cost competitive, whatever the fuel might be, the private sector will bring those fuels to market most effect effectively. That is why it would be counterproductive to allow regulated public utilities to use their monopoly to squeeze out private sector involvement in the EV recharging business. That is precisely what utilities are trying to do right now in a number of states throughout the country. And if they are successful, it would not only preclude companies such as Love from participating in that market, it would cement in place stagnant technologies and fueling solutions that at the end of the day will not get consumers what they want. Fuel retailers have to be cognizant and responding to their customer demands in order to succeed. Utilities do, utilities do not. The best path forward is to leverage existing infrastructure and refueling sites that are strategically located where cars and trucks are known to travel and develop policies that make it profitable for those businesses to invest in alternative fuels. On behalf of Natso and the Love family of companies, I look forward to continue working with you to achieve what I believe are mutually compatible goals. And I'm happy to answer any question that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Feldhansen. And now we move to Commissioner Fellman. You are recognized for five minutes and welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, Tonko, and Ranking Member Shimkus, as well as distinguished members of the committee. I'm Fred Fellman, Port of Seattle Commission Vice President and Managing Member of the Northwest Seaport Alliance. The port's diverse business lines include managing commercial fishing and cruise terminals, as well as the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. In partnership with the Port of Tacoma, we also jointly manage the fourth largest container port complex in North America. We're committed to carrying out our mission in an environmentally sustainable manner while recognizing the needs of disproportionately impacted communities. As founding chair of the Port's Energy and Sustainability Committee, I look forward to this opportunity to share the progress we've achieved voluntarily and identify opportunities to collaborate in the future. In Washington State, we're very fortunate to have a green grid powered primarily by hydroelectricity. In addition, we've made significant investments in wind and solar projects, creating additional renewable energy and jobs in the districts of Representatives Walden and McMorris Rogers. The aviation and maritime sectors are particularly difficult to decarbonize. According to the International Air Transport Association and International Maritime Organization, air transport and maritime shipping each account for about 2% of the global CO2 emissions and will continue to grow unless action is taken. Nonetheless, the Port of Seattle has a goal of being the greenest and most energy efficient port in the nation. At SeaTac Airport, we're providing preconditioned air and electricity to power aircraft while they're at the gate, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 40,000 metric tons. We're also installing charging stations on our airfield to support ground handling equipment. Off airfield, we're transitioning our bus fleet and central heating plant to a renewable natural gas. Our taxi and ride sharing services are required to meet strict fuel economy standards and we're providing electric vehicle charging stations to the public. Our longer term goal is to fuel every flight at SeaTac with 10% blend of biofuel by 2028. Sustainable aviation fuels have a life cycle carbon footprint of 80% lower than the current jet fuel. For the maritime sector, the Port of Seattle is one of the first ports in the country to install shore power at a marine terminal enabling cruise ships to turn off their engines while at berth, utilizing our low carbon electrical grid. Plugging container ships into shore power at the Northwest Seaport Alliance's major terminals would also result in emission reductions of nearly 14,000 tons of greenhouse gas annually. Connecting all our cruise ships to shore power would have saved over 10,000 metric tons last year alone. The ports of Seattle and Tacoma also require that all cargo trucks entering Seaport Alliance international container terminals are at least 2007. At the Port of Tacoma, they're nearing completion of an LNG terminal to serve maritime vessels. Additionally, the state's ferry service is transitioning to electrification. 
Moving forward, our primary strategy is to electrify marine terminals and convert diesel powered drayage trucks and cargo handling equipment to electricity or other clean energy sources. The job ahead of us is daunting. Maritime and aviation transportation systems and global supply chains are complex and the port's authority to manage them is limited. Funding is a huge obstacle to faster implementation and we must also carefully balance our environmental priorities alongside our economic and social responsibilities. Support from the federal government is needed to help us overcome these challenges to meet our carbon emission targets. We ask that Congress support the transition to sustainable aviation fuels through funding, research, and interagency partnerships. Support electrification for marine terminals and other clean energy solutions for maritime operations. Increase funding and expand program eligibility for environmental elements of projects that reduce emissions. And harmonize federal and global efforts to decarbonize ocean-going vessels while at sea. Climate change is already impacting our abilities to operate our core businesses reliably and predictably. But this is also creating opportunities for innovation and job creation. Our ports are supporting the state of Washington's Maritime Blue Initiative to drive innovation and advance clean maritime technologies. Creating jobs of the future will enable our region to capture a growing portion of the global maritime blue economy that is expected to reach $3 trillion by 2030. Similarly, by supporting the development of sustainable aviation fuels, there will be broad-based benefits for research institutions, refineries, farmers, foresters, and feedstock producers. Thank you again for the opportunity to join you today. Decarbonization of the maritime sector is a big, bold, and essential goal. The Port of Seattle and the Northwest Seaport Alliance look forward to working with Congress to achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Mr. Blubau for five minutes, please, and welcome. Good morning. Thanks to the committee for having me here today. My name is Tim Blubaugh, and I am with the Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association. I would like to share with you a little bit about our industry, about our successes in reducing both criteria pollutant emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, and our investments in zero emission uh, technology, truck technologies. EMA is made up of the United States' leading manufacturers of heavy-duty trucks and engines. The products that EMA member companies design and build are not just big cars. The annual sales of heavy trucks in the United States is a small fraction of passenger car sales, yet they come in an extremely wide variety of sizes and configurations. Commercial vehicles are highly customized for many diverse applications, including parcel delivery vans, pickup and delivery trucks, refuse trucks, construction vehicles, regional freight tractors, and long haul tractors. Heavy trucks are purchased by sophisticated business entities as a capital investment, one that must return a profit. A commercial fleet will specify the details of the truck they want the manufacturer to build so that it will serve the, needs, the needs of their unique trucking operation with the lowest possible life cycle cost. For more than 50 years, EMA member companies have worked cooperatively with regulators to dramatically reduce the environmental impacts of our products. The emissions from today's heavy-duty trucks and engines have been reduced by 99% from those built 30 years ago. That remarkable success does not happen without enormous capital investment and incredible technological innovation. The success of those investments and innovations were maximized because the target emission regulations were aligned nationwide and provided the regulatory certainty needed for a level competitive playing field. Key to implementing those regulations, government and industry work collaboratively to update the nation's diesel fuel supply to ultra-low sulfur diesel or particulate matter filters and to establish a nationwide retail market for diesel exhaust fluid for NOx after treatment systems. After successfully implementing EPA's near zero criteria pollutant standards, EMA member companies shifted gears to implementing EPA and DOT's historic heavy duty greenhouse gas and fuel efficiency rules and we later collaborated again to develop the more stringent phase two rules that will go into effect in 2021 with further reductions in 2024 and yet more in 2027. Our industry continues to innovate. We have advocated for EPA to pursue the Cleaner Trucks Initiative announced last year to both to further reduce NOx emissions and to modernize the regulatory program. In doing so, we have cautioned that any additional NOx reductions must not undermine the existing greenhouse gas and fuel efficiency program or the nationwide regulatory alignment that has consistently existed for the heavy duty program. The inherent trade-offs 
between NOx and greenhouse gas reductions demand that any standard to further reduce NOx emissions must be carefully crafted to avoid undermining the nation's greenhouse gas emission goals. EMA members are not just working in the regulatory space. Independent of any regulatory push, and on top of the enormous investments needed to meet the stringent phase two greenhouse gas standards, our members are investing billions of dollars to develop zero emission powertrains and trucks. However, converting a commercial fleet to battery electric technology is nothing like convincing a consumer to purchase a zero emission passenger car. Attractive styling or effective marketing will not persuade the trucking fleet's business managers who are forced to operate on razor thin profit margins that battery electric trucks make financial sense. Converting the commercial vehicle marketplace to zero emission will require a coordinated effort by government, industry, and other stakeholders. Not only must manufacturers find the resources to develop the battery electric technology for low volume sales in a wide variety of vehicle configurations, but fleets need to adapt their entire trucking operations to such paradigm shifting technology. Fleets will need, may need to adjust truck routes, utilization, maintenance, and other practices. And they will need to invest in training, new maintenance facilities, and new parts in inventories. Most importantly, fleets must invest in developing the infrastructure needed to charge the trucks. The transformation that the commercial vehicle industry went through to convert to ultra-low sulfur diesel and to establish the nationwide availability of diesel exhaust fluid was challenging, but it pales in comparison to the enormous challenge of converting the industry to battery electric trucks and esta establishing the infrastructure needed to charge them. Our members are proud of what they've accomplished in implementing stringent emission standards and we embrace future challenges. We look forward to continuing to supply the trucking industry with the products they need to cost effectively and efficiently move freight while balancing the need to minimize impacts on the environment. While we work to increase the acceptability and deployment of zero emission commercial vehicles, we also caution that there will be unprecedented challenges. Success will require time, enormous investment, cooperative efforts by all stakeholders, and ultimately marketplace acceptance. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move to Dr. Eckerly. Uh, you're recognized, sir, for five minutes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Walden, Chairman Tonkel, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the committee, thank you for, for inviting me here today. My name is Wayne Eckerly and I've been doing research and technology for 43 years, 30 years at Cummins. Sustaining a vibrant economy while preserving the planet for generations to come is a challenge of our time. Cummins and I personally have set an aim to meet that challenge. Cummins celebrated its 100th anniversary this year. Over this 100 year period, Cummins has primarily- Mr. Chairman, can we ask him just to use another mic? Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh just turn Excellent yours off law. and try another one. We'll see what's it's a little distracting, and we don't want to be distracted. <laughs> okay. Uh, and do you have that one on? Yes. Okay. There we go. That's like it's working better. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'll just back up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, Cummins Cummins celebrated its 100th anniversary this year. Over this 100-year period, Cummins has primarily supplied power to its customers with internal combustion engines. Today, there are more than 15 million engines in use by our customers, primarily running on diesel, but also natural gas, renewable natural gas, and biofuels. Over the past three decades, we have improved efficiency of our diesel engines by 80% and have reduced our NOx and particulate emissions by 99%. We, commit, we commend the committee's commitment to facilitate the transition of the U.S. economy to net zero greenhouse gas pollution by 2050. We also recognize that sectors that come in supplies significantly contribute to emissions, and we commit to doing our part to address climate change and air quality and have adopted science-based climate goals. We look forward to joining forces and innovating with the broader energy community toward a comprehensive solution by decarbonizing our primary energy sources. So what does the path forward to carbon neutrality look like? It has to be a multifaceted approach using multiple technologies. I see internal combustion engines continuing to play an important role to meet this goal. Cummins will continue to grow and apply our powertrain and vehicle system expertise to optimize powertrains and systems of vehicles through connectivity and automation to generate greater energy and fuel efficiency. Cummins is also investing to enable its engines to use fuel sources that would otherwise be considered waste products, delivering robust power with fuels like landfill gas and digester gases. To reach the goal of a 100% carbon neutral power supply, the energy source for the internal combustion engine must also be carbon neutral. To that end, 
Cummins is partnering with the Department of Energy National Labs and other uh, companies to create the decarbonized energy sources needed to operate internal combustion engines in a 100 percent clean economy. In addition to continuing to innovate on our engine technology, Cummins is putting more focus on battery and fuel cell powered electric powertrains. We are investing heavily in powertrain electrification through our research and development and through our recent purchase of several battery and fuel cell companies. For instance, we are the number one global provider of hydrogen fuel cells for locomotives. We clearly see batteries and fuel cells as part of our portfolio of solutions to meet a carbon neutral future. Factors like infrastructure, electricity source, geographic region, and power, power needs will often help determine which solution works in a given situation. But to be clear, an electric vehicle is not a zero emissions vehicle unless the electricity is generated from a power plant that also has zero emissions. Policies need to incentivize low or carbon neutral technologies to help us reach our goal. Otherwise, costs will remain a nearly insurmountable barrier. Customers want payback period, payback on their initial technology investment within a short window of time. Today, without subsidies, electric powertrains cannot compete on cost with internal combustion engines. Cummins continued, invest, continued investment in infrastructure for alternative fuels like natural gas and hydrogen fueling can help deplo deploy these technologies faster. From a policy standpoint, in order to reach a carbon neutral future and get there effectively and successfully, we need three things. One, we need government investment in R&D and infrastructure. Two, we need policies that support the goal and enable us to develop the technologies to get there. And three, we need national regulations that are uniform, predictable, and enforceable so we can continue to invest in these technologies to meet the national goals. In conclusion, the heavy-duty vehicle industry is undergoing significant change and Cummins is leading the way. Of all the challenges that I have personally faced, this is by far the most difficult one. However, I also did not think 43 years ago that we would have been able to reduce emissions in a diesel engine by 99%. Because of this past success and the American spirit of innovation and ingenuity, I am confident that if the right policies are put in place and if the government and business really do work together, we can develop the technologies to attain this goal. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much. And then finally, we'll go to Mr. Martinez for five minutes, please, and welcome also. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Adrian Martinez, and I'm a staff attorney for Earth Justice. Earth Justice is a nonprofit legal organization, and I work out of the Los Angeles office. I've been working on smog pollution for the last 15 years in the nation's smog capital. And while this has provided great job security, because we have a lot of smog in Los Angeles, um, it also um, has shown that we need to move to zero emissions. I'm part of the Right to Zero campaign. And essentially what the Right to Zero campaign was based out of our air quality work in California. And in looking at how do we get to meet clean air standards, we looked at all the emission sources. We kind of looked at what uh, regulations were on the books uh, in California and federally and what else we needed to do. And we came to one conclusion. We came to the conclusion that we need to move to zero emissions in our transportation sector, in our energy sector, and in our buildings, and then eventually in our industrial processes. And we came to that conclusion for many reasons, but when we look at the amount of air pollution that come from all these sources, um, there's just this incremental approach of slowly um, uh, cleaning up engines was not going to work. Um, in summary, kind of our solution is uh, when we look at our best uh, climate strategy in a place like Los Angeles, the best solution is to actually solve our air quality problems. And the main reason is to solve our air quality problems, we need to move to zero emissions. The first point I want to make today is that uh, this area is moving very fast. This morning I saw two electric buses uh, on the streets of Washington, D.C. Three, even four years ago, there would be zero, and I would have never thought I'd see an electric bus on the street. Um, we're seeing movement in the trucking sector, in the locomotive sector, and all these sectors. So I'm going to start with transit buses. Um, on the transit bus sector, uh, this is one area on the larger vehicles where we've seen a lot of progress. Um, there's more than 2,000 buses on the roads or on order in North America. 
and this is a dramatic increase from years prior. The ways that the federal government can continue to support this, we need to continue to support uh, transit agencies purchasing these vehicles. Um, we need to encourage development of large scale infrastructure to charge. It's one thing to charge one to five buses. It's another thing if you're a large um, fleet like uh, Los Angeles Metro that needs to charge hundreds of buses at a depot at a time. Uh, this is an area where we're going to learn a lot of information. We like to focus on public agencies because as they're figuring out charging and how to operate um, larger vehicles, this is information that can be transferred to private industry too. Second point, the second um, sector I'd like to focus on is school buses. This is an area we're seeing a lot of progress nationally. There's a lot of interest in how do we transport our children to school in a zero emission way. Uh, school districts need a lot of support for buses in general, but moving to electric school buses is a critical area. The one um, positive of school buses is because of their operational profile, where they're operating for very limited times of the day, and then some are even dormant during the summer, they could provide an additional grid resources for um, energy utilities. We're seeing energy utilities, even as close as Virginia, um, get into this um, to the game of electric buses because they see it as a way to deploy electricity in a flexible manner. Uh, I want to focus on refuse trucks. We're starting to see more on electric refuse trucks nationally, uh, and we're seeing it all over the country, from New York to Carson, California, to Ada County, Idaho. We're starting to see deployments of electric refuse trucks. These are electric vehicles that inherently are pro popular. Whenever we talk to people about the potential for a quieter uh, refuse truck, they are very excited in their neighborhoods. Um, I want to close to talk about ports. One of the, the areas where we spend a lot of time focusing are on our ports. Uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach have the two busiest ports in the nation, and these are some of the areas most impacted by air pollution in, in the region. Uh, the ports provide an important opportunity for advancing zero emissions. Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles and Mayor Garcia of Long Beach have committed to achieving 100% zero emissions in cargo handling equipment and um, drayage trucks by 2030 and 2035, respectively. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of technology deployments. The Port of Los Angeles just deployed a, um, a top pick that is 100% zero emission. And just for context, this has a one megawatt battery. So it's a big piece of infrastructure. Infrastructure is key, and this is a place where this committee and the federal government can play a big role. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to uh, member questions. I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes, and we'll go across the, uh, the panel. Uh, Dr. Wimberger, let me start with you. This morning we have heard a lot of potential solutions, including some that are in the early stages of being deployed. But we also know we are working against the clock to achieve major emissions reductions. With that urgency in mind, what are the most important things the federal government can do to ensure these emerging solutions are commercialized at scale? question. I think there's a great role for the federal government to have technology neutral fiscal incentives to really drive research and development and then early deployment of some of these advanced technologies. Um, there is, we've, we've heard a lot about sort of the expense of the upfront capital costs and some of the uncertainty that businesses face when thinking about deploying specific technologies. But I think there's a real role for the federal government in the near term to, to see Technology neutral is really important, but to keep fiscal incentives on the table as a really important driver to overcoming some of those market barriers to getting technologies into market. Thank you very much. And let me go down the panel and ask each of you um, what is most needed from us, from the federal government, to scale up the solutions you've highlighted in your respective um, industries. Uh, Mr. Baines? Yes, well, I think um, a, a comprehensive approach is necessary, and there are a lot of policy options out there. But like, uh, like was indicated, I think uh, incentives for these nascent industries would be quite important. They can be through the IFS program, they can be wind multipliers. There's um, opportunities through the tax code as well, with um, exemptions, investment exemptions, or blenders, in, uh, blenders incentives. So I think there are many, many different policy options out there that the federal government can take a position on. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Phil Townsend. Yeah, no, I second that. Uh, I think the most important thing for us to, to make meaningful investments in this is that we get some horizon and some certainty around the regulations and especially the, uh, 
the uh, tax credits or, or uh, RIN mechanisms or LCFS mechanisms. So I think that's the, the really number one. Uh, and I also think it's important that we focus on the, all of the, the above uh, solution. I think if we get really pigeonholed into certain specific things, uh, then, then that slows the efforts down. Um, and I think uh, also if we, we're looking at existing regulation like the RFS, I think Mr. Shimkus has uh, brought forward a, a, a cleanup of, of some sort of the, the RFS. Mm -hmm. And I think we should always uh, make sure that these uh, uh, existing regulations are uh, current. And I would like just to use one little example. We addressed the ethanol blend wall really aggressively by ma the lowering the mandate for ethanol because the market could not absorb more ethanol blending. Uh, so we took that down. Uh, I think if you look at the cellulosic category, there we had very, uh, you know, we had really aggressive uh, uh, goals uh, and the industry couldn't meet them. So we took the mandates down well through RNG and that was based on switchgrass and all these other, you know, exotic things. But I think RNG has now come in and solved that and there's a lot of runway to, to uh, increase that one. So thank you. That much. Thank you. And Commissioner Feldman. Well, uh, certainly the comprehensive approach makes the most sense, but in the near term, the idea that uh, the, uh, whether it be tax credits or other incentives be a level playing field, as we've heard, is to start with. We need to fund research and innovation because a lot of these solutions have not been made, but there's a lot of smart people in the tech field that just haven't applied themselves to this world. Obviously, interagency coordination is critical. Public investments in, as we were speaking, we can, uh, be the, the guinea pig to try out things. We can justify at the port investing in programs that will ultimately create jobs at the same time as creating these uh, innovations. But ultimately, I I with the aviation biofuels, which is really one of the great challenges, and I got to visit Nesty's facility in Rotterdam to take lessons learned there, but we need a market demand. And if uh, DOD committed to a certain percentage that would basically, the refineries would come if they knew there was a guaranteed market for their fuels. Thank you, and Mr. Bluba. Uh, with the medium and heavy truck to commercial vehicle industry, we have to pay attention to the diversity, all the different products in the industry, and, and think about a systems and a holistic approach, thinking about tractors and trailers, manufacturers and fleets and infrastructure. Um, I think the incentives help overcome the, the marketplace barriers to the higher cost, the, tech, the incentives should be technology neutral, and I think we have to make, pay attention to barriers to uh, deployment of greater greenhouse gas redu reductions, such as more stringent NOx emissions or things like the federal excise tax that, that tax these enhanced technologies at a 12% rate. Thank you, Dr. Eckerly. Uh, as I, I mentioned, government investment in R&D, as well as in the infrastructure, uh, having sound policies that are aligned with the goal is, is, is really important because that will develop the fundamental technology that we can take forward and finally national regulations that are uniform so that we're all rowing in the same direction. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Martinez. Uh, I think one of the big things that needs to happen is research and development and support for public agencies figuring out how to charge larger number of vehicles. We have transit agencies that will have a lot more vehicles, we have ports, these, these types of investments will learn a lot of information. Thank you to each and every one of you for your advice. And now uh, uh, we'll recognize Mr. Shimkus, our uh, ranking member of the subcommittee for five minutes to ask questions, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the staff would put up uh, the chart from uh, Loves that produced to us, and hopefully I'm gonna have that passed out to you all too if you have it. Um, Mr. Phil Henson, will you briefly, and it's hard to see, I get it, but you all have yeah. here, can you just briefly highlight, I mean, I, I found this very, very helpful. You got question marks here for the, you know, the cost of infrastructure or the vehicles. You have uh, CI scores across the board uh, and range issues that I think are very, just very instructive. So briefly, can you highlight some of these points? Yeah, so, so what we really tried to achieve here was, uh, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about policy and research and R&D. Uh, we tend to talk very little about how does this look from the consumer's perspective. So what we were trying to do is say, kind of saying, well, if, if we set all these other things aside, what does it look like from the consumer perspective and what are the real carbon score savings? So I've listed uh, 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 existing fuels being diesel, B20 and RD, renewable diesel, uh, where we really don't need any infrastructure investments at all. Friends like Neste are, are building plants and we're, we're getting access to the fuel and it follows the existing um, logistic chain. CNG and RNG, 
there is uh, a lot of existing infrastructure there as well in our natural gas infrastructure. Uh, the investments there would really be to upgrade the fleets to CNG engines. It's a different engine altogether, so, so uh, you need to, to have a unique uh, engine in your truck. Uh, and we also need to develop, uh, obviously we have a lot of natural gas already uh, coming out of the ground. Uh, we can supplement that with renewable natural gas, uh, but that's a, a fairly established business already. Then we have all these new uh, technologies that requires significant infrastructure uh, investment. So if you look at the price, yeah, a CNG truck is a little bit more expensive than a diesel truck. When it comes to uh, uh, EV and hydrogen trucks, there really aren't any commercial options um, available on the market today. You hear a little about Tesla, Nikola, and this, but these are not uh, commercialized uh, um, operations. Uh, so I really can't come down any of the price. And I don't know if our friend from Cummins has any thoughts on Well, let, let me just jump in because yeah. I want to get to three yeah. points. But I do want to highlight, in our discussions yesterday, you talked about range. I think range is a big yeah. issue, too, especially we've got our, our colleague here from the Port of Los Angeles. And if you have a warehouse that's 500 miles away and an electric uh, tractor trailer that goes 300 miles and then you exactly. have to stop for a charge, um, that raises the cost of the good, that that r is really challenging. Uh, yeah, so so uh, two things happen with, with range. In order to achieve range on EV, you need to add battery capacity. And if you add battery capacity, you increase the weight. So uh, if you want to have an electric vehicle that goes uh, 500 miles, you will lose 40% uh, of your payload load just because of the weight of the battery. Yeah, thank you. And I don't mean, yeah. I, I do mean to cut you off because I want to yeah, get to yeah. a couple no, no, other no. questions. <laughs> um, the, um, I also like the importance of this hearing on uh, we're tapping around the renewable fuel standard and the um, the, the bucket of, of the cellulose bucket or what we call the advanced bucket mm -hmm. that industry then moved into the RNG uh, debate, which I think is really critical and important. Um, uh, Mr. Bain, Mr. Feldhausen, Mr. Eckerly, um, talk about that real quick about uh, the, uh, maybe not accurately as much, but as far as the REN issue debate on this portion? So if we, if we look at the sustainable aviation fuels, um, that wins, it's a, a multiply of 1.6. For renewable diesel, it's a multiply of 1.7 today. Uh, I think that's, those are the, um, d these kind of um, policy options, they really incentivize producers to go one way or another. Yeah, and let me drop in now with a question on, you, you mentioned the word drop-in fuels. Uh, and let me go to Mr. Eckerly because I'm going to ask him, the importance of drop-in fuels? Yeah, I mean... It, and it, a definition of it real quick? Yeah, drop-in says, you know, it, it basically, we it, it could run on a current petroleum fuel or that fuel with no change in our, in our engine system. And so, w you know, we're all in favor of that. It's, it, it so that would cut down maybe a huge infrastructure cost if you dealt with a different uh, debate or it, a different if, if there's enough of supply. Let me stay with you and finish with Mr. Bluebaugh. You both in your testimony talk about a national regulatory environment. I think Mr. Bluebaugh's uh, statement and uh, Mr. Eckerly, you mentioned national level emissions policy and regulations. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, for us, is that as we develop our products, if we have to develop them for different regulations, it really divides the resources that we have. And Mr. So Bluebaugh? Uh, the same. The, all EMA members supply vehicles nationally and globally. If we have one national program, we can develop those products much more efficiently, provide them at a lower cost, higher quality. So I'll finish with my, uh, I got one second left, and just say, I, I think you're addressing the concern that there'll be a balkanized market based upon regional differences and rules and regulations, and I think that's an important point to be made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Chairman Pallone, full committee chair, for five minutes to ask questions, please. Thank you, Chairman Tongo. I wanted to first uh, ask Mr. Martinez. I appreciate uh, your being here today, and, and thank you for your work on behalf of the frontline communities in Southern California. Uh, how would you describe the nexus between climate pollution and other pollutants like ozone and particulate matter, and how will addressing the climate crisis help communities like the ones that you've worked with, if you will? Yeah, th there is a big nexus, because um, when you look at a lot of the climate pollution, it, there's also air pollution associated. So 
in Los Angeles and communities throughout the nation, the ports, airports, they're a large source of emissions. And what we're seeing a really effective tool is to address the air quality problems as a way to push zero emissions. And we're seeing ports and other entities m move that way, albeit it is a difficult um, approach, but it is something that's needed. And I just want to put a plug in, the Moving Forward Network has provided some recommendations on how to move forward. Uh, some national standards on these types of equipment to advance zero emissions, and I think those will be important um, issues to address. Ah, thank you. As I discussed in my opening statement, smart policy plays a critical role in driving American innovation, and this is especially true for the transportation sector. So I wanted to move to Mr. Eckerly. Um, in your testimony, you highlighted Cummins' legacy of innovation. Uh, in your experience, how has ambitious and predictable policy helped to fuel this innovation at Cummings, and how would federal climate policy affect your work for the products of, of the next decade? How's that on? Having predictability ar around regulations is, is very, very important. Our product development cycle is on the order of, 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 th of three to six years. And so as we do that work, when we have an eye on where we have to be and when, it just drives our invest investment. And so it really allows us to focus and be able to deliver products that are needed. From, from a climate change standpoint, it's very similar. To the extent that we have a national regulation, we understand it. We will, we will tailor our investments appropriately and be able to hit the goal line much more efficiently. Oh, thanks. And in my opening statement, again, I, I mentioned that certain transportation subtectors can't be really readily electrified and are going to need transition to low and zero carbon fuels, and that Congress can play a key role in this transition as part of the 100 percent clean economy of the future. So let me ask Mr. Baines. How has California's low carbon fuel standard influenced your investment decisions and strategy for developing and commercializing uh, innovative liquid fuels? Well, I think the uh, low carbon fuel standard provided a really clear and robust policy for us to be able to build up our production around and to, uh, and to be able to develop that as a market. Um, there's a, it's a long term policy. Uh, so there's the transparency for us to be able to make the kind of investments that are needed uh, to produce low carbon fuels. All right, then let me ask you, and also maybe Mr. Wimberger, what should the federal government be doing in the near term to help drive the market for low or zero carbon fuels in aviation and, and for ocean going vessels? I'll ask Mr. Baines and then we'll ask Dr. Wimberger. Well, um, I, I think um, it goes again to this comprehensive uh, approach with there are many different policy options that are out there. Um, incentivizing uh, the research and the production of these fuels, incentivizing the um, incorporation or the blending of those fuels are different options. Uh, there are some options that we can have um, in the RFS program around the RIN multiplier, like I mentioned earlier on. Um, and uh, the tax code can also can also play an important role in that. Okay. There are lots of options. Thanks. Dr. Wimberger? I would echo a lot of the statements about consistent policies and having a really strong price signal um, through a clean fuel standard that opens up to, that incentivizes fully the lowest carbon fuels across different applications. So not just focusing on liquid fuels, but thinking about electrofuels and thinking about really innovative ways that we can have a really strong price signal that will drive innovation and technology um, in these areas. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I the, yield back. the gentleman yields back. The Chair now recognizes Representative McKinley for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this whole concept of 100% um, renewables by 2050 is interesting. Um, uh, as an engineer, uh, it's going to be great uh, for employment for engineers and scientists for the next 30 years. Um, but I think it's delusional to think that it, it, uh, in some aspects that we're ever going to achieve that. So I'm curious to see how this language um, gets worked out. Because I, I want to focus on airplanes uh, uh, as much as I can, because the other things, we maybe it's more doable. Airplanes, I, I would teach me. I, I can be. I can learn about this because uh, I'm just curious. Because jet fuel, um, the specific energy of jet fuel, is about uh, is uh, 50 times the density capacity for batteries with lithium-ion batteries. Um, I'm curious how we're going to do that um, 
to, to move into that arena on that, especially given that for a Tesla car using lithium ion batteries, it's a thousand pounds for an automobile. Can any of you give me an idea what's the size? If it's a thousand pounds for a Tesla car, what's it gonna be for an Airbus 320? Anyone have an idea? I, mean, I don't have that, I'm, I'm not, it, please. Well, I do know that there's a company in the Seattle area that's uh, in the process of getting certification for a modification of a Beaver, a, an older plane, that they're using one engine as a electric engine and one as a traditional jet engine. And they're able to demonstrate the ability to do, in a relatively small plane, the ability to actually fly. So I'm, I'm, I'm the technologies the are planes. getting there. We, we have right now, we know the capacity, we can, we can do that. Uh, um, uh, the Purdue engineers at their aeronautical program have put something together, MIT, saying small planes, yes, we can do that. But I'm talking about the, the 320s, the 747s, the 737s, uh, you know, how we're going to be able to do that. Uh, so I, I'm curious, at what's the size? And it's one thing to say the size, whatever that might be. But then I want to go to the airports. What are we going to happen? If you exhaust your, your battery storage at the end, are you going to, how long is it complain? If we if we complain now about our length of time on, on waiting for, for for traffic, how long is it going to be to recharge that battery to fly that plane back to Pittsburgh or back to Sa San Diego or where that might be? Well, or, we're looking are we forward gonna, to the more. No, it, sorry. Or are we going to replace the battery, which might be the faster way to do? Pull it out and replace it. That's fine. We. What happens in small towns? What happens foreign when we fly? to Honduras or we fly to Guatemala, are they gonna hold our batteries for us so that we can move them in? I don't think so. I think we're gonna be safe. We're gonna, we're gonna create a problem for ourselves. We're gonna have consequences as a result of this because we're, we're just quite frankly, we're not there yet. I think uh, I want us to do it. I love the idea. I think it's for an engineer. I think it's fabulous to be able to have this kind of aspirational goal of where we might go with this. Uh, but. I, I would think that, quite frankly, instead of doing these delusional concepts, why aren't we spending the time to develop batteries better better than we are right now, putting funding into research at National Energy Technology Laboratory to find out how, how are we gonna find ways to replace lithium? Because we, we know it takes 500,000 gallons of waste water to produce one ton of lithium. And that will only generate enough batteries for 10 cars. We've got to find a replacement for lithium. So I, I'm hoping over the next 30 years is we use our engineering technology and science and find new battery, new ways of doing it, or cobalt, where the increase, where we're dealing with a, 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 a terrorist activity, a terrorist government in, in uh, Congo, and their increased price on cobalt was 142% last year. Do we want to do business with people trading in red di uh, blood diamonds? I think we should be spending more time, instead of passing legislation like this, putting more money into research to find out how we can do, how we can actually achieve this. Because this is a, there's a great article in Aviation Week, just came out in January, said it ain't gonna happen, folks. We can do it on small planes, but when we get to larger planes, we don't have, the, we, it's gonna take more than 30 years or longer but I'm looking at posing a challenge to you. What do we do in a small airport? What are we gonna to do to them when they land on that? What do we, can any of you give me an idea? Well, my time's expired on it. How are we gonna deal with this in pure Illinois? Thank you, yield back my time. The gentleman yields and uh, the acting chair recognizes himself for five minutes. No, you're the chair. You're the chair. Uh, the chair, the, the real chair. Um, First of all, I, I want to say uh, a very encouraging testimony. I, I, I see we're really committed to moving in the right direction, and I really appreciate that. Um, Commissioner Fellman, the Port of Stockton is in my uh, congressional district, so finding ways to reduce port-related emissions is very important to me and my constituents. Uh, you mentioned how federal support for the development of electrified cargo handling equipment is essential de to decarbonizing the sector. At the Port of Stockton, we've seen how state and local partnerships can make a real difference. Can you speak to some of the hurdles 
that are facing widespread adoption of electrified cargo handling equipment at ports across the country? Thank you. In fact, you know, the Port of Seattle has been beneficiary of some of California's hand, hand-me-downs because they've been taking this mm -hmm. initiatives to make progress on the technology that we are now advancing from there. But the, the one of the challenges is just the, the, the power for the top picks. There's like a lot of, uh, well, it hasn't been designed for actual commercial utilization, but there are, um, basically it's the terminal operators that have to shoulder these costs. There are port is a landlord port, so we basically lease to the terminal. That terminal operator then, you know, assumes all those costs. So initially, changing over from a tier four is like what we're doing right now. We're getting into the better diesel operations, but to go from that to electrification is is primarily an expense. We do have the shore power. That infrastructure is getting put in place, and the uh, the discussion about battery change out in Long Beach. We know that. You know, the, the cars just come in there and they swap out the right. battery packs. That's not the challenge. Storage and electricity isn't the challenge. It's, you know, primarily an expense. Cost. And, and actually the technology of not all of it has been electrified. Um, can you speak to how power demand is managed at ports and how electrification of machineries impacts that? Well, we're sort of lucky in, in the Seattle area. We have the green grid right. from hydropower and City Light has its own <laughs> dam. But um, if we really had a huge requirement, we Bonneville Power Authority can route power to our thing, that's the Columbia River system. But I think ultimately it's gonna require storage so that we can use, you know, like cruise ships are only at our dock for like 10 hours and they're huge demand. So we can sort of uh, schedule, you know, having storage in place for when the demand varies. So I'm, I'm hoping that, like uh, with uh, the electronic world, that we'll have a Moore's law of batteries. That, that's, I would agree very much, that that's where we have to continue to invest, but. Right, that, know, battery storage is key to this, and um, they're, they're making investments and improvements now, I think. I don't know if we're gonna see Moore's law, though. That's, that would be pretty optimistic. Um, Mr. Eckerly, can you discuss how we can best deploy zero or low carbon fuel systems at ports across the various types of transportation systems that serve them? Well, it, it's really a matter of, of, of getting infrastructure in place, you know, fr from, from our, 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 our standpoint, as those fuels become available, you know, we're, we're ready and able to, to utilize those in, in, in our engine systems. So it's really the, the investment in federal dollars are needed in your opinion yes, for that? Yes, in the infrastructure, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weinberger, I want to thank you for your work at the CARB. Uh, basically, you've set standards for the country and it's made a lot of difference in our district. I mean, uh, it's clear that in the Central Valley, the Thule fog that used to be a real problem is now dissipating and, and, and not appearing because there's less uh, particular pollution in the air to attract that fog. So you've made a lot of difference uh, in people's lives. Um, ports are a major hub for heavy duty trucks. Uh, in mid-November uh, 2018, the EPA announced the Cleaner Truck Initiative focused on modernizing regulations for heavy-duty trucks relative to heavy NOx emissions. Uh, but to date, the EPA has not proposed a single regulation under that initiative. It is not likely to do so until the spring of next year. How are we going to reduce NOx and greenhouse gas emissions on a tight least on a tight schedule to protect public health and reduce greenhouse emissions? That's a great question. Um, I think as uh, the chair of the Air Resources Board, Mary Nichols, uh, just responded to EPA, um, the head of EPA, um, there are challenges in California in achieving our 2031 and 2032 NOx requirements in the South Coast, and a lot of that does deal with emissions that are covered um, under federal regulations, so including trucks um, and ports and locomotives. And there were commitments made to work together collaboratively to see reductions in those areas. Yeah. And I think there are ongoing conversations to think about how we can reduce NOx emissions in that time frame that are required. Um, there is only so much I think the state can do, and we're seeing huge declines in California for NOx emissions in non-attainment areas under um, California-specific regulations, but there are, are mobile sources where EPA does right. have preceding jurisdiction, and we're seeing increases in those emissions in the future. So there's ongoing, it's, it's gonna be tricky, it's gonna be tough, um, but we've reduced emissions tremendously in California, and we'll continue to do so to protect public health. Thank you. Um, my time's expired, and uh, 
I'm going to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, you know, I, I, I think this idea, this notion of 100% uh, clean energy for our transportation network is a, is a very noble, a noble goal. Um, uh, and, and I also think that it's a mischaracterization uh, for those that think that uh, my Republican colleagues and I don't support green energy initiatives. Uh, we simply don't believe that you can ground our economy to a standstill uh, in order to get there. Uh, you got to have an economy that will support market-driven solutions to accomplish these things when, uh, if, if we want to get there. And, you know, technological innovation has unlocked a vast supply of natural gas in the shale plays in my district in eastern and southeastern Ohio. And as we're all aware, these shale plays have helped to drive down the price of natural gas, making the fuel uh, a very affordable option for our energy and manufacturing needs. So, Mr. Feld Hansen, how has the current price point of natural gas influenced Trillium's decision to build projects reliant on compressed natural gas? I would say that the, there was a uh, wave kind of uh, converting over the road uh, engines to CNG back in 2012-13 when um, you had, you know, crude at hundred and some dollars and uh, natural gas was still $2.50. The fact that crude has come down since then has uh, lessened those incentives a little. But you, uh, you still have the, uh, the uh, uh, fuel mixture credit, which is uh, part of uh, RFS, I guess, or uh, uh, tax extenders, that would uh, you know, incentivize more usage. Uh, but we see tremendous progress on the transit side. So if I look at the over-the-road trucker, the guy who bought the CNG truck in 2014, he probably is buying a diesel truck today based on the incentive structure that's available. But on the transit side, where you have uh, asset that depreciates over a longer time, uh, it's still an economic uh, advantage. And as you can see on the schedule, just compressed natural gas uh, using fossil natural gas gives you a 21% uh, uh, reduction in carbon intensity. So it's not zero, but it's 21%. It's moving in that direction, yeah. A as you know, uh, uh, continuing with you, uh, the U.S. is also exporting liquefied natural gas to our allies across the world because of our vast supplies and resources. Yes. Do you feel this increasingly global supply of gas could influence the greater use of CNG transportation projects throughout the rest of the world? I think you're seeing uh, natural gas increasingly becoming a, a fuel source uh, in all parts of the world as well. Good, good. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Eckerly, uh, continuing uh, along this line, I understand Cummins produces engines that run on CNG. Can you talk about the prospects of that business, the research you're doing to improve the performance and application of natural gas fueled engines? Yeah, I mean, we, we work on our improving the performance of our natural gas engines just like our diesel engines. And so we, we are continually uh, working on technology that's, that's going to uh, reduce the emissions, and we're increasing the efficiency of those engines substantially as well. Okay. So, so how can your work advancing uh, technological innovation in the United States engine market translate to clean engine and fuel advances that are affordable in other nations that are much higher in their greenhouse gas emissions than, uh, than the United States are? Yeah, you're probably aware Cummins is a global company, and uh, last year we produced one and a half million engines, all right, many of those in, in countries outside of North America, and s the te technology that we're applying in North America, we're applying in those countries as well. So the efficiency benefits are global, and all of our products, we're working to meet lower greenhouse gas in all, in all those countries. Okay. Mr. Blueball, do you have, a, do you have any thoughts along this line? Yeah, it, the, the heavy truck industry does export quite a bit, um, as, as Dr. Eckerly said. Some of the challenges are we have tried to uh, export the cleanest diesel trucks, and what you need, you need ultra-low sulfur diesel to do that, and you need diesel exhaust fluid. We have just gotten Mexico uh, moving forward to where they could adopt the cleanest 
trucks, the 2010 trucks, but you, but you need that infrastructure to support those vehicles. Sure. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Eckerly, I apologize. I didn't, I couldn't see your name tag for your cup. I didn't, I miss, I called you Mr. Eckerly instead of Dr. Eckerly. So I'm, I apologize. No need to apologize. I can be Wayne. <laughs> I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Barragon for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the conversation and you all being here. I happen to represent America's port. It's the busiest port by container volume in the country. Um, we have a, a lot of jobs and our economy is heavily, heavily dependent on it. Um, and with that said, my district is one of the most heavily polluted districts in the country. It uh, has the port of LA, inclu including the port of Long Beach right next door, and it's surrounded by three freeways. Um, and so this topic, um, of what can we do is critically, critically important to me and my constituents. Now, the ports combined um, are right across um, and, and a part of my district and they're responsible for significant amounts of local air pollution. So from sulfur dioxide, particulate matter and nitrogen oxide levels, which is exacerbating the environmental disparities in my district, a district that is a majority minority almost 90% Latino African American, and they are on the front lines of the pollution that's resulting. Um, there's been a, some discussion about the ports um, and what has been done. Now, although the ports have actionable clean air plans, which have reduced emissions, there is so much more work to do. And the purpose of these hearings is to try to get ideas on what we can do and legislation we can add so that we can do our part. Now the climate crisis is, is urgent. It is urgent and we are seeing people marching and people recognizing that and we as legislators need to as well. And so I appreciate uh, the work you're doing, Mr. Martinez, um, in my community and in the area to address the issues. Um, and you, saw, you talked a little bit, Mr. Martinez, um, about some of the work you've done with pollution and environmental justice issues in Los Angeles County and California. Can you speak and you spoke a little bit to the progress of um, what is being done to uh, reduce emissions, but can you maybe give us some concrete steps that can be taken to build on that progress Then we can consider trying to put into either this um, legislation that we're gonna come up with on the 100% by 2050 and or the Lift America Act, which is our committee's infrastructure portion of the bill. Yeah, if you look at the examples of the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach, it started out with an emissions inventory. To the extent ports haven't done one of those, they should, because you need to know where your emissions coming from. Uh, second, they developed what are called clean air action plans. Uh, you know, these are strategies for each category of equipment. And then the third thing is, I think the ports of LA and Long Beach have their zero emission goals for at least two big parts of their operations trucking and cargo equipment. I think that's important. One thing that the Port of Long Beach did that was particularly important was an e EV blueprint process where they spent uh, some time bringing all stakeholders from industry, from community, and the kind of the best thinkers on how do we get to electrify their cargo equipment. And I think it, pursuing that at ports across the nation um, to allow them to figure out how do they get to zero emissions is, would be a good strategy. Okay, according to information from the Clean Air Task Force, uh, marine shipping is 2.6% of the global greenhouse gas emissions and could account for 17% of these emissions by 2050. Equally concerning is that existing fueling solutions are either marginally cleaner or face technological obstacles. Um, Mr. Baines, are federal programs to invest in and support the development and development of emerging energy technologies in shipping sufficient, and can you expand on recommendations in your testimony for how we can do more to support innovation to drive down emissions? Thank you for the question. The Neste does focus mainly on the road transportation and the aviation sector. Our fuels can be used in marine applications. Uh, our renewable diesel is being used today in California in some of the ferries where it already reduces emissions. Mm -hmm. I think one of the beauties of the fuels that we produce is that it's a drop-in fuel. So it is the existing engines, it's the existing infrastructure, it's existing technology today. So there are no um, investment costs required to be able to benefit 
from lower greenhouse gas emissions, from lower environmental pollutants. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the great advantage of these kind of fuels that we produce today. Mm -hmm. well, one of my concerns is we talk a little bit about um, the natural gas and the calls for low sulfur substitutes. But you know, I think we need to think bigger than that, and we need to think bolder than that in figuring out how do we get to the zero emissions, how do we get um, to that place given the urgency that we have um, so that we can make sure that we're doing enough to avoid the warming um, of the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you all for your work, and hopefully we can continue the discussion. Five minutes is nowhere near enough time to have this conversation. I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Long of Missouri for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the transportation sector represents the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in our economy, and we have a lot of room for improvements to reduce emissions. That being said, I think it is important that this committee works together to put forward practical and common sense solutions rather than proposing pie in the sky ideas that are unrealistic and would harm our economy. That is why I was proud to work with my good friend, Congresswoman Matsui from California, on a bill to reauthorize the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, which I was glad to see pass the House with bipartisan support. Our bill provides grants to states to upgrade other, older diesel engines with cleaner, American-made technology. This is a great example of bipartisan solution that makes real differences in the real communities like mine. My home state of Missouri is using the Dura grant money to upgrade school buses to make our sure our children are breathing cleaner air on their rides to and from school. Diesel engines can have a long working life with a slower turnover rate, which allows older engines to operate for a longer time. With roughly 10 million old diesel engines still in operation today, it is important that we continue to make use of homegrown technologies to upgrade these engines and improve our environment. Mr. Field Hansen, the Diesel Emission Reduction Act of 2019 reauthorizes the program through 2024. As EPA Administrator Wheeler notes, this is an effective and innovative program to improve air quality across the country. DERA, DERA funds has proven to be a cost-effective tool to help communities meet their air quality impl implementation plans and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. My question, what is your view of the program, and is this an example of the practical use of existing policies to drive for cleaner transportation? I would say typically we, we um, look at our role is, as really adapting to the programs in a, and, and uh, we rely on gentlemen like yourself to really come up with, uh, with a lot of the, uh, uh, um, call it the politics behind it. Uh, and our job is really to, to bring it to market uh, effectively and, and um, uh, cheaply. And I, and I think uh, putting a little uh, example around that is uh, I think you brought up the DEF here. We saw a little bit earlier which I think is, is a great story where you're seeing uh, an implementation, uh, I think we're about 60% implemented today with these new modern engines that are lower emissions. So it's working for sure. Good, okay, we answered the second part of my question and that, so I appreciate that. And uh, in this series of climate hearings, I've tried to focus on how we can reduce carbon dioxide emissions while keeping energy and commodity prices low, particularly for rural agricultural communities like those that I represent where the two of the biggest industries are farming and trucking. From what I have, what I've seen, the uh, Green New Deal and other decarbonization efforts seek to replace fossil fuels entirely with renewable energy. Mr. Bluebaugh and uh, Mr., or I guess Dr. Ackerley, I just learned, uh, do you have any tech, any, uh, do, you, do we have the technology to decarbonize the farming and trucking industries while continuing to produce and move goods to market without raising costs on farming, trucking, or consumers? First, I'd like to say with, with DIRA, less than 50% of the trucks are current technology because trucks are durable and the new trucks are expensive. DIRA is an excellent way to overcome that hurdle and get more to the newer, greatest, latest and greatest technology. As far as, um, as, far as farming equipment, Upgrading farming equipment um, is a challenge. It, it, it can be done. We're working on the technology to do so, um, but the, the, the cost of the technology is often a barrier and similar to, to uh, the, the benefits of DIRA, allowing farmers or uh, other people who use that equipment, the, the ability to afford the new technology is critical. 
Okay, and uh, can we do it without limiting the mobility inherent in diesel engines? It depends on what technology. We, we can't, there, there's, no, there's no broad brushed approach to this. It depends on what is the application and what is the technology. Uh, obviously, current latest, the clean, near zero emission diesel technology can do that um, without limiting, limiting its performance or its capabilities. Okay, and uh, for you or Dr. Eckerley, either one, uh, what would be necessary for electrification to work for heavy duty vehicles and farm equipment? Uh, I mean, the, the, the more power that, the, that a piece of equipment or a piece of transportation uses, the more difficult it's going to be to replace it with pure electrification. You know, there are certainly applications where, where uh, carbon neutral fuels are going to be the right answer you know, in an internal combustion engine. So one size does not fit all here. Okay, thank you. I have no time to yield back, but if I did, I would yield it. <laughs> <laughs> we understand your kindness, sir. Uh, the gentleman yields back, and uh, we now recognize for five minutes uh, the representative of Delaware, uh, Representative Blunt Rochester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this very important hearing today. The science is clear. We must transition to a 100% clean energy economy as quickly as possible, and if we're going to avert the impacts of climate change. I hear every day from my constituents in Delaware about the impacts that they already feel whether it's a farmer whose crops are suffering from extreme weather or a small business owner who relies on the tourism of our Delaware beaches or young students just worried about the future. Delawareans know all too well we must address the climate crisis. The transportation sector will play a key role in solving this problem as is our, our now is our country's largest source of carbon pollution. We have an opportunity to transition our transportation sector to zero or low carbon fuels, but we must do it in a just and equitable way. All too often, the communities that are hit first and worst by the impacts of climate change are communities of color that suffer from some of the worst air quality in the nation and floods any time that it rains. Thank you to the panelists for your testimony today. I'm especially excited about today's hearing because we have a modernizing and expanding port in Wilmington, Delaware where we have a real opportunity to innovate during this expansion to reduce our emissions. Already, as part of this expansion, our port will have electric cargo handling equipment. Uh, my first question is mis to Mr. Fellerman. Uh, you detailed the great strides that the Northwest Seaport Alliance is taking to reduce emissions. And following along with, uh, on Ms. Barragan's questions, what steps can Congress take to accelerate these efforts at ports across the country? And absent federal action, do you think that, um, that we'll be able to really see progress uh, in terms of transitioning to low and zero carbon fuels at ports? Will it happen on its own? I really appreciate the point. If we don't have a national policy, a commitment to doing this, then it all falls apart. If you look at our greatest competitor to the north, Canada has a national policy to move freight across the country. In fact, they're serving Chicago at a cheaper cost than we are at the Port of Seattle because they have a unified national policy to do that. There are efficiencies that we can achieve. One of them, most importantly, is on-dock rail. And the, so you eliminate trucking to portion of your use. So that is one way to uh, be very efficient. Unfortunately, the rail lines right now, this is a little bit of a monopolistic challenge, mm -hmm. is uh, we're, we're $300 a container at a cost disadvantage to Canada because of uh, disparatous rail rates. So while we want to get this cargo onto rail, at the same time, it is a asymmetric situation for us. But there's other efforts like idle reduction measures that you can, you know, scheduling a truck to get to the uh, dock when the container is ready to pick up. And, but the, the, the scraps program, the DERA program that was spoken of, we've taken great advantage of that. And I, I only think that that is one way in which we can, as I said, turn over these long-lived trucks and get, get on to the next phase. So, Thank and, you. But I think just the last thing Mr. Martinez said, you know, you have to measure what you care about. So you have to have an inventory. We're on our third round of inventories. We're watching the relative parameters go down. As we win some things, trucks become a greater portion of the pie. Gotcha. 
So I think that's a critical way to be strategic. Well, I'm going to shift to Mr. Martinez. Um, how will the steps taken by the Port of LA to reduce emissions improve air quality for communities near the port? Yeah, so uh, the ports of LA and Long Beach have been doing programs for many years. Um, I'm part of a coalition that's pushing them to do more because the air pollution crisis in the communities is still uh, very high. Uh, one thing they did that I think is important, they're working to advance zero emissions in cargo handling equipment. And one of the biggest challenges there is on infrastructure. How do you plan for adding a significant amount of new equipment and how do you charge it in an effective and safe way? And I think helping them figure that out and support for that will be important. Great. Well, thank you for that. I, I wanna say I was fortunate to um, be on a bus our, one of our electric fleets in Delaware this year. We did kind of a ribbon cutting and it was really nice. They had the, it's electric, you know, on the bus for electric slide. Um, but I, it made me think as you were talking, um, you know, Mr. Martinez, and, and I guess I wanna ask this of Mr. Eckerly. Um, can you elaborate on why a national policy rather than a patchwork of different efforts is really necessary? because it allows us to focus on the right technology. The more we're divided, the, the more different technologies we have to invest in, we can't do a great job for everybody. Thank you so much, and I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Representative Carter, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor and privilege of representing the first congressional district of Georgia, which includes two major seaports, the Port of Savannah, number two container port on the eastern seaboard and the port of Brunswick, the number two roll-on, roll-off port in the country. So very familiar with what we're talking about here and very appreciative of all your initiatives to, to make sure we're doing everything we can to, to decrease in, in emissions. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Fellman, Fellman I wanted to ask you about the, the port of Seattle because I, I know that you mentioned that the, the port has done quite a few things to, to to decrease emissions and electrification, increasing the, the, the efficiency of the diesel engines, even as much as, um, from what I understand, uh, uh, putting out mussels and oysters to, be, to, to help in carbon sequestration. What a great idea and what a great initiative. That's wonderful. But what, it, what I have a question about is about mandates versus incentivizing because the Port of Savannah and the Port of Brunswick, the Georgia Ports Authority runs both of them, have done a great job by themselves in, in making sure that they have decreased emissions and making sure that they have done all of the above and, and making sure that they're taking care of our environment. And I just, um, you know, you, you, there was an announcement earlier this year that you were investing in technology to improve traffic flow at the terminal. How, how is that, How's that going? Because the, the city, the port in Savannah is one of the least congested ports in America, which I think makes it very attractive to, to a lot of the users, the fact that it is the least congested, one of the least congested around. Well, with all due respect, your ability to have uh, started to outcompete the port of Seattle makes me reluctant to give you our tricks. But <laughs> the, uh, I, do, I do very much uh, appreciate your interest. You know, one of the challenges the Port of Seattle has is that we're really embedded into the city. So our, our uh, last mile is a particular challenge. So that advantage that you have as a less uncongested area is a, um, is, is a great advantage. The, um, the, the benefits of getting uh, trucks on appointment is a huge thing. So having smart gates has been something that we've been investing in. And so trucks can actually sit and wait in a parking lot and get called on appointment. So this is a, a and that huge decreases advantage. idling time. Which yeah, yes, and um, and it's a better condition for the drivers. One of the things we didn't speak to is really kind of the trucking model. For those folks that are lucky enough to be in a fleet, the fleet can make a major investment and amortize it over a long time. The drayage fleet is a independent operator. So they only these guys mostly immigrants, very disadvantaged are only paid per container they move. And so, um, so it's greatly in their advantage as well to have a faster turn to right. turn around. And all these things that we were talking about, the business model of it, anything that saves fuel is good for the bottom line. So this, this is ultimately everybody's best interest to, to find ways of doing that. I, um, I don't know that, uh, 
I, I think the throughput was the, the primary thing, but I don't know if you have on-dock rail, because that's one of the great efficiencies yes. that, that you can move so much more cargo Absolutely. per. Absolutely. And then the train engines we've heard about are also getting right. quite a bit cleaner. Right, and that has been something. And, and another thing that we've worked on in Georgia is the inland ports. And that has really helped us where we can rail the cargo to the inland ports and then disperse them out. That's helped with the congestion, and it's, and it's all also helped with the efficiency of the port as well. I am, as you can tell, I'm very proud of the job that the Georgia Ports Authority has done. I, I think it's, they've done an outstanding job. So a lot can be learned there. But, but my, my main point I wanted to get at is that, you know, they've done a lot of things on their own without having to be mandated from it. And that's what I, I'm really proud of and really want to see us do. I, I hate for us in Washington, D.C. to be mandating everything that has to be done to, to increase efficiency. Well, I, I appreciate that. I'm sorry I missed that point in the first part. Right. The fact is that Washington State and probably you as well are in attainment. Like, we are not breaking the law yet. As in California, they have to do this if they want to stay in business. Exactly. But our goal, elevated self-interest, we don't want to fall out of attainment. So by taking these initiatives proactively before the law requires it, enables us to grow responsibly. Absolutely, so, and, so and I think in, in a much better way. Yes, yeah, so uh, some of these things need some investments federally for innovation to get us to the next level, but as long as we realize that if our future is to serve this greater growing market, we have to take these initiatives before <laughs> the hammer comes down. Absolutely, well thank you, and thank all of you very much for all your initiatives, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Washington. Representative Rogers is recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank the panel for being here today. As we look to reduce emissions in the transportation sector, it's important we pursue policies that reduce transportation-related emissions that are realistic, technology neutral, and make economic sense. Government mandates, as my previous colleague uh, just mentioned, whether at the federal, state, or local level can often have drastic unintended consequences. In Washington State right now, uh, some politicians and special interests, for example, are threatening to breach the four lower Snake River dams that are in my district. Uh, Governor Inslee is currently spending almost $1 million of taxpayer money to justify doing this. Setting aside the significant negative uh, impact on our clean, renewable hydropower generation. Breaching the dams would also significantly increase light duty vehicle emissions. Many farmers and other businesses in eastern Washington rely on barging on the Snake River and on the Columbia River to ship their products west to the ports. Barging is one of the most efficient, eco-friendly methods of cargo transportation. If the dams were breached, farmers would have to look at other shipping methods. We export 90% of the wheat that is grown in my district. We export 50% of the potatoes. We export peas, lentils, garbanzo beans. It would have taken, in 2017 alone, it would have taken 135,000 semi-trucks to move the cargo shipped on the Snake River. Additional, uh, um, this would drastically increase emissions in Washington State, not to mention the uh, additional congestion uh, that we already face at the port. I believe instead of wasting taxpayer dollars on an expensive effort to increase carbon emissions and decrease clean energy production, we should be encouraging the development of new technologies and efficiencies that decrease emissions in the transportation sector. One of the biggest challenges in decreasing emissions from vehicles is turning over fleets and getting older, less efficient vehicles off the roads. I'm concerned about costly government-imposed mandates and policies that significantly increase the cost of new vehicles. You can mandate the most fuel-efficient green car or truck in the world, but if no one can afford it, it's not going to decrease carbon emissions. Right now, the average car in America costs $38,000. A lot of people cannot afford that, even though we would especially want our teenagers to be driving the most uh, efficient and safe cars. But they can't do it because they can't afford it. So what are we doing? Our cars are getting older. Average car in America is now 12 years old. In my district, is 15 years old. Mr. Bluebaugh, 
Approximately how much more does a new truck cost today as a result of all the new emission reduction technologies? And are there any barriers, for example, a 12% federal excise tax to purchasing newer, cleaner trucks that Congress could address? What are the risks if we impose even more costly emission requirements? If we were just able to fully turn over existing me medium and heavy duty fleets uh, in the current and near term, what would the emission reduction impact be? Thank you. Um, as I said before, I think less than 50% of the trucks on the road today are to the latest emission standards that went in place in 2010, almost 10 years ago, and we still haven't gotten 50%. Um, the, the benefits of turning the fleet over to those new cleanest diesel engines would be tremendous. It's, it's hard to measure exactly what it would be if it's a truck that was 30 years old the benefits would be dramatic. If it was a truck that was uh, 15 years old, less dramatic, but still a huge improvement. And one of the barriers that we see is, to, to you, that you pointed out on passenger cars, we see that on the heavy truck world, we call it a pre-buy and a low buy. Before the 2007 emission standards went in place, truckers bought a lot of vehicles. We ramped up production to sell the older vehicles. It's not an efficient way to produce vehicles, it's, it's, uh, it causes us to hire people and then turn around and lay them off later. The pre-buy and low-buy cycle is, is not advantageous and it doesn't help the environment because it increases the number before the standard. So we think um, mechanisms like the FET that adds 12% to the cost of this emission, it adds 12% to the cost of the vehicle. So if we add 20 to $40,000 worth of uh, emissions reduction equipment, that's $2,400 to $4,800 in tax on top of that increased expense. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited about the Sustainable Jet Fuels uh, program also, and I didn't allow enough time for you to talk about it, Mr. Fellman. Sorry. Uh, I yield. I ran out of time. The general lady yields back. I um, have received a number of documents for the record, and so we'll ask, uh, request unanimous consent to enter the following into the record. They include a letter from the association of American Railroads, a letter from Securing America's Future Energy, or SAFE, a letter from the American Public Gas Association, a letter from the Diesel Technology Forum, a letter from the Advanced Engine Systems Institute, including the executive summary of a June 2019 report from the uh, Manufacturers of Emission Controls Association, we have a letter from NGV America, and finally, a chart uh, provided by Mr. Failed Hansen comparing various truck engines. So hey, I, I request unanimous, unanimous consent to enter the following. Without, Without objection, objection um, so ordered. I see we've been joined by our colleague from Illinois, um, the gentle lady uh, from Illinois, Representative uh, Schakowsky. Take a moment. No. No, when you're ready. Settle in, and we'll recognize you for five minutes, please. Uh, a devoted member, I would say, of Energy and Commerce. Thank you. I want to apologize to the, the panel. It's just there's all these other hearings and negotiations going on. So I thank you for being here. I thank you for your testimony. I ha do have a few questions. So I'm from Chicago, and um, Chicago area is home to five airports, including two major ones, O'Hare and Midway, and last year O'Hare International Airport was the busiest airport in the world in terms of takeoffs and, and landings. Um, and we know that uh, aircraft accounts for about 9% of transportation emissions, and you know, while that doesn't sound huge, um, it has uh, also increased more than any other subsector um, in 2017 in terms of, uh, of emissions globally. Um, passenger traffic increased about 6.4% last year um, with air traffic um, increasing. It's important that we ensure that aircraft trans, uh, trans uh, that, that aircrafts transition to clean energy and renewable fuels. So um, 
uh, Mr. Baines, in, where are you, Mr. Baines, in your testimony, um, uh, you mentioned the importance of sustainable aviation fuel. So I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, about that. Where does the United States stand compared to other countries in, the, in terms of the development and deployment of sustainable aviation fuels? And let me just ask the second question. In your opinion, why has the United States been so slow in developing and using sustainable aviation fuels? Yes, I, <laughs> that's good questions, actually. Um, sustainable aviation fuel is a drop-in fuel. I, th I think that's the, that's the big advantage of the fuel today. So you just drop it into the existing infrastructure. Um, I, th I think one of the reasons why it hasn't been used very much yet is it's really a nascent industry. Mm. Um, we, there are a number of plays in the market today. Uh, Neste is today, um, has the capability today of being the largest producer of uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Different countries have adopted different policies. The, the Europe, uh, in Europe, they have taken a more of a mandate approach. Um, in the mm. United States, there, th there's different policy options uh, where, where it's going to be maybe more incentive-based. The point is to have this comprehensive approach. That's the, the most important. And to have the transparency of what is the direction you would like the industry to go. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the aviation industry wants to have sustainable aviation fuels. Um, they are committed to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. So this is, this is really a solution that can work today. Thank you. Um, I want to go on to a, a different issue. Airport and air traffic systems also have massive impact on the communities that, uh, that are around them. Often these are um, disadvantaged communities who are disproportionately affected by noise and conventional um, pollution. So uh, Mr. Martinez and um, Mr. Fellman, what steps can port authorities take to protect these communities that are near airports? One of the things we found that uh, just within the last few years is the implementation of NextGen and so what it's done is uh, taken what was a diffuse impact and concentrated it so that the planes are flying in a much more uh, singular route. And so this really makes for winners and losers. And so uh, the way in which FAA implements that, some communities have it more diffuse, some communities have it direct on. And we find that um, it, it doesn't seem to be necessarily uh, with a rhyme or reason, like the why, why it's implemented in some places and not. There are efficiencies associated being able to move planes you know, in a quicker uh, descent and or um, closer spacing. But like I said, there's uh, tremendous disproportionate impacts associated with that. The flight patterns themselves, if we can put more over the water for longer periods of time, Puget Sound is kind of an unusual water body. I, I'm gonna cut you off. Um with that, and maybe we could get something in, in writing from you. But Mr. Martinez, I want to give him a second to answer this. Yeah, I'll just point out that uh, LA World Airports is moving to zero emissions and all in its buses and other fleets, and then trying to figure out additional um, aircraft. And I will provide some follow up in afterwards. Okay, I appreciate that. This is an important issue in the Chicago area, so we want to be able to help the communities surrounding the airports. Thank you, and I yield back. The general lady yields back, and uh, we know you appreciate you it. Should so. thank you the ranking member. Th 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 do you want to thank the uh, gentleman from Illinois too? I certainly do. I want to thank Mr. <laughs> Chairman <laughs> and Mr. Ranking Member, thank you. and <laughs> I really do appreciate the opportunity to participate here a little bit. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we thought you might have been the last person today, but we are also following by. Dr. Ruiz, uh, representative from California, recognized for five minutes, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you. And thank you to all the witnesses here today to uh, discuss how we can decarbonize the American transportation sector. In the face of our current climate crisis, it is urgent and imperative to drive our transportation system towards cleaner fuels and technologies. 
We must also address the threats that medium and heavy duty transportation poses to clean air and our public's health. As an emergency medicine physician, I have seen the human face of the public health consequences of air pollution. Air pollution causes asthma, stunted lung development in children, respiratory infection, heart attack, strokes, premature death. Mortality in polluted areas is higher than in other areas. Uh, a study published in April of this year on the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences estimates that over 100,000 Americans die each year of illnesses caused by human-caused particulate matter pollution in the air. Particulate matter are tiny particles, as you know, emitted from chemical factories and transportation vehicles that can penetrate the lung-blood barrier, entering the bloodstream directly and poisoning uh, our community members' lungs. Uh, Ms. Wimberger, in addition to the personal suffering caused by the health effects of air pollution, there is significant monetary cost for individuals and society. Can you speak about these costs and the burdens they impose on communities? Yes, I think this is a really important point. We talk a lot about the cost of taking action and the capital cost and the upfront cost of equipment and fuels and vehicles. We don't talk about the cost of not taking action and thinking about the health impacts that we're seeing, not only from increased levels of criteria pollutants and toxics, but also carbon emissions and looking at sort of the social cost of carbon and the health impacts associated with it. There are very dire consequences that we're already facing in California. Um, we're seeing exacerbated wildfires. We're seeing non-attainment areas and increased cases of asthma and premature mortality. So there are very real costs to not taking action, which is the flip side of the coin that I think we do need to, as an economist, I think we do need to consider. That's a really important point. Absolutely. As we know, air pollution is particularly worse in low-income communities and communities of color. Riverside County, where I am from and now represent, ranks among the worst in the nation for ozone pollution. And the Inland Empire in Southern California, of which Riverside County is a part of, also has some of the country's highest level of particular matter. The fact is respiratory illnesses caused by air pollution are preventable if we commit to upholding proper safeguards to achieve a 100% clean economy and decarbonize areas of our economy like our transportation sector. Mr. Martinez, the Environmental Protection Agency's own website acknowledges that, quote, low-income neighborhoods, tribal pollutions, and communities of color that live in urban areas may be disproportionately exposed to air, po air pollution, which is a barrier to economic opportunity and security. Do you think the federal government is doing enough to protect these disproportionately vulnerable communities? No. Um, I think the, there's a lot more that needs to happen. Can you, can you explain or expand on how Congress can help address these environmental injustices as we consider pathways to decarbonize our transportation sector? Yes, and Riverside is kind of the hotbed of air pollution in California. They get the regional smog, the fine particulates, and the localized health uh, effects from uh, hundreds of thousands of diesel trucks operating in Riverside each day. Um, there's a lot more that can be done to set additional standards for um, trucks, locomotives, and other equipment that would be beneficial. Uh, there's a lot of work. But, but uh, those are general. They don't really specifically address the environmental injustices. In fact, I recently introduced a bill, H.R. 3923, the Environmental Justice Act of 2019, which requires agencies consider the environmental justice implications of their programs, policies, and activities, such as transportation programs, helping ensure that we protect our communities and vulnerable populations. So I definitely look forward to working with you on the committee uh, and everybody else here to uh, toward a 100% clean economy protects our nation's health and ensures all individuals have clean air regardless of income, race, or zip code. And let me just, since I have 40 seconds left, right now in my district, we're experiencing an extreme environmental injustice where a company who had not had permits to function has, uh, has a fire on its mulch where there's other debris on there as well. It has polluted the air with smoke for eight days now Four, uh, uh, four days of an entire school district shutting down, uh, 25 students getting sick enough to go to the hospital, six transported via ambulance. In addition to the pollution that we're facing in Riverside County, primarily because the 10 runs through there, this is 
a rural underserved community of farm workers of which I am part of. I am a result of this community. Uh, I grew up in a farm worker trailer park. I understand the environmental hazards that lacks of consideration of environmental justice issues can have on the health and the long-term viability, outcome, wellness, education, and development of children who have to breathe the pollution. So I look forward to working with you to getting this done. The gentleman yields back. I thank all of my colleagues for uh, participating today in what I think was a very important uh, hearing. And certainly, and most importantly, want to thank all of our witnesses. You've been a uh, tremendous force on behalf of uh, innovation and change. And uh, we thank you for joining us at today's hearing. I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days by which to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by our witnesses. Uh, I ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. And at this time, the subcommittee is adjourned. <laughs>